everyone. I'm Carrie Delbot, Westgas Chief Operating Officer, and I'm here with Mark McCarran, our Chief Investment Officer. It's great to see you, Mark. Hi, Carrie. Yeah, good to see you. We have quite a lot to talk about today. As you know, a lot of things happening in the economy, the markets, and the world in general. So we're looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely. Uh, Mark, the, the title of today's webinar is Inflation at an Inflection Point and the 60-40 portfolio. So why don't we jump right in with a focus on everybody's favorite topic, inflation. Uh, the Federal Reserve kept its short-term interest rate unchanged this week for a second straight time, but left the door open to further rate hikes if inflation pressures should accelerate in the months ahead. And this follows one of the most aggressive series of rate hikes in four decades. So would you expand on this so-called inflation fight and its impact on the market? Yeah, uh, Carrie, this is really the, the focus of the market. Um, you know, every move, every comment from the Fed gets a lot of attention. And I think it's good to look back and, and put this into perspective a little bit because uh, the Federal Reserve is fighting the inflation fight. Um, and why is that? Well, pre-pandemic period looked pretty normal. When you look at it from an unemployment standpoint, which is the blue bars here, which are below four percent, um, the, the orange line here is the is or is the interest rate the Fed uses to control inflation and and uh, control the economy generally or try to, uh, and then the blue line there is um, inflation as represented by consumer price index. So all those were, were sort of well behaved. The pandemic hit, unemployment sh uh, shot straight up. To 14%. Um, actually, initially, inflation dropped. And with that, the Fed cut rates to zero, near the zero. But inflation started to pick up pretty quickly post pandemic and reached a, a really multi decade high of nearly 9%. And the Fed then was forced, as you mentioned, to raise interest rates pretty aggressively to try to bring that inflation down. And what we've seen since the middle of last year is inflation has, in fact, fallen from its peak down to about a 4% rate, um, and that's good. It peaked, it bumped up a little bit last month because energy prices remain relatively high, and the economy rain, remains pretty hot, and the unemployment rate remains low. So this big recession that everyone is expecting this year hasn't yet occurred, even though the Fed's been very aggressive. And that's led to, well, maybe we have to expect that the Fed's going to keep rates higher for longer. You know, that's the whole idea is higher for longer because the economy seems to be hotter than what was expected. Um, but, you know, I think what we want to talk a little bit about is, well, what's driving that? And the good thing is that inflation's off its high. Um, some of the other things that we're looking at very carefully is the rise of geopolitical conflicts uh, in the Middle East. Uh, remember, Russia, Ukraine continues, and now we have Israel and Gaza, um, really causing some uncertainty. And um, and that you know that's hard to predict. So the rising geopolitical conflict is one thing. There's also rising political uncertainty here in the United States. And believe it or not. Um, that's not just within the House of Representatives, but believe it or not, we're, we're within a year or so of the next presidential election. So this is this is really what's driving markets. Um, and what we've seen is the economy is pretty strong, uh, but the Fed is still fighting that fight. And that's why we've seen the volatility in the market. I want to talk a little bit about the impact the Fed has had on the on the bond market. And you can see that looking at 10-year bond yields and two-year bond yields. Uh, again, pre and post pandemic, but the pre pandemic period, it was sort of normal. And then it dropped to during the pandemic, very low rates, especially in the two year. And what's happened now is the two year bond rate has gone way up to 5%, highest it's really been in, again, in decades. And that follows the, uh, the Fed policy trying to uh, control um, inflation. The blue is a 10 year bond yield, and that's also been a high, higher and more recently approaching that 5%. And that's because um, the market prices uh, in expectations, and that's how it's reflected. It's really reflected in the 10-year bond yield. Uh, what we've seen is that uh, the yield curve inverted back 
last year where the two-year bond yield was higher than the 10. And that's usually an indication of, of an economic slowdown. We haven't seen it, but that's what the market's anticipating. And we'll see. So that movement in the bond yields was a negative to the bond market in, itself. It was a reset and bond prices went down as yields went up. While that was a painful reset in some cases, higher bond yields today finally offer an attractive uh, alternative really to the stock market, providing four or five percent um, yield. And, and, that, and that yield turns into return. And that's a good thing for a portfolio committed to a balanced allocation. We'll get into that shortly. The other thing I want to highlight too is that the bond the bond market was weak last year. The, the stock market's been narrow. So I, I'd say that's weak as well, but it's hard to tell. So the strong returns in the stock market this year so far began to weaken in the third quarter and so far in the fourth quarter actually too. Um, but it's been very much of a narrow market driven again by the large growth index. And just a reminder, 33% of the S&P 500, a very uh, common index, is invested in just 10 stocks. And 28 of them happen to be in technology and consumer technology names that everyone's well aware of. Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, NVIDIA, Tesla, and Meta, which is the Facebook parent. So this is, outside of those seven, um, the market's not as strong. And actually, a great way to look at that is if you, if you take the same S&P 500 index, which is weighted by size of the company. So Apple has the biggest weight. Microsoft has the second biggest weight. If you just equal weight all 500 stocks, you actually get a, a return that's a little bit more modest, much more modest than the actually S&P 500, which is up at least through September 30th, close to you know, 12, 13%. The S&P equal weight index is up less than, uh, less than 3%. And I think that indicates that the market itself is not as strong as it seems. So clearly we have a raised, rising interest rate environment, high inflation, an aggressive Fed policy, negative impact on bonds, and a narrow stock market. And that's sort of why I think we're getting some questions in and around what the, what the strategy is uh, going forward with respect to balanced portfolios. So let's jump right into that topic then. Balanced portfolios, some of the questions we're getting. Um, we wanted to spend some time today on the 60-40 portfolio. And as, as many may know, the 60-40 portfolio has long been revered as a, a guide for the moderate risk investor. 60% allocation to equities intended to provide capital appreciation, and then a 40% allocation to fixed income to offer yield and risk mitigation. However, the tables turned in 2022 with the 60 portfolio experiencing poor performance relative to recent history, at least, as both sides of the portfolio came under pressure. You just mentioned a weak bond market, a narrow stock market. Should investors be recalibrating their expectations given the environment? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, always when there's a little bit of challenge to a strategy, uh, the the Headlines come out and say the 64 portfolio is dead, uh, move on. We want to take a, a broader look at that, a historical look. And if you look at this chart over here, this is a 60-40 balanced portfolio um, shown since 2000. And what we're showing here is a three-year rolling return. So you can see it's sort of an average return over, over three-year periods, starting back in 2000 and going through September 2023. And so... Um, <clears throat> First off, I would say that the 60-40 balance portfolio, the rolling three-year return, has generated performance consistent with expectations over this full time frame. So that five, six percent expected return is sort of the average return that you've achieved. Um, but you're not always at the average, right? Some years you're you're below that and well below that. And this is the 2008-2009 credit crisis. The balance portfolio came under pressure that year in that period of time because the stock market was down so much because of fears of recession as a result of the housing crisis. Uh, we saw a commitment to the 60-40 payoff because the three years ended September uh, 2011, 2012, they were well above expected returns, right? And, and so, um, and then really a, a moderation 
of this. So the 6040 was sort of doing its job here for about 10 years. During the pandemic, we got another a shock and, and a, a jolt actually to the strategy and the, and the strategy performed well above expectations. Well, uh, you we talked a little bit about what it means, but that you know, 6040 portfolio came under pressure again in 2022 um, and is under pressure a bit today. And and so really, this is part of a normal cycle. Periods of economic and market volatility can temporarily drive a diversified portfolio off the course. We do not think the 6040 portfolio is dead. In fact, the 60% allocation to stocks has been dominated by these technology names, but could benefit from a broadening market. So we're not dependent only on seven or 10 companies to drive it. The 40% allocation of bonds, as we talked about, has undergone a very significant reset, but today's higher yields, 5% yields, uh, they offer attractive returns going forward. And, and that gives me confidence in the 60-40 portfolio that we've we've got more to go here and, and not to give up and not to recalibrate, but to expect maybe that you might get more return from the bond market going forward than you have in the past. Terrific. Thanks, Mark. Um, maybe, uh, again, changing gears a little bit, it, it's hard to ignore some of the risks in the news you mentioned already, geopolitical, political. Unfortunately, the list is even longer. Why don't you expand on those risks? It would be great to also dive into some of the opportunities too. Uh, and then close us out on the Westcott outlook and portfolio strategy. Yeah, the, the, the fact is we build balanced portfolios at 60-40 portfolio because we cannot predict the impact that certain things may have on markets, the economic risks, geopolitical risks, political risks. We just talked about those. But those introduce a lot of uncertainty um, and can knock a strategy off course if it's too narrow or, or too dependent on a certain environment. Then one thing changes in the in the world, in the economy, and the portfolio strategy comes under pressure. We don't want to, to do that. We still want to have a portfolio that's resilient across all of these things. So whether we look at the geopolitical risks in the Middle East, the political risk here at home, um, inflation remains a risk from an economic standpoint, but we see good trends there. Interest rates uh, remain high, and that's a risk to uh, the economy in the, in the global markets. And if all these risks were to sort of come to fore, you'd wanna have a bond allocation in your portfolio that prevents you from, um, you know, that pro provides some stability. On the other side of that though, risks bring opportunities. You know, the income you can get in the bond market is higher than it's been in a long, long time. And that's a positive. The commodity market that tends to do a little bit better during periods of uncertainty, particularly in, in, in un, unrest in the Middle East, um, uh, that drives energy prices higher, oil prices higher. That's a component of the client portfolio as well. Precious metals, <clears throat> I guess we mean gold by that. We have an allocation to gold in portfolios and that has uh, the benefits of of really providing that stability, that alternative, uh, if if equities and bonds are under pressure, and from a valuation standpoint, not everything is expensive, right? We we do find some areas and pockets of opportunity that um, offer interesting dividend in income and yield going forward. So the portfolio strategy that we follow remains committed to the bond market despite the risks. The yields are high and attractive. The value stocks in the portfolio remain interesting to us because they've not participated as much in the narrow market, but offer value going forward. International emerging markets. Now, while the, the geopolitical risks sort of fall outside the U.S. at the moment, there's a lot of political risk inside. We want to balance those risks out. International and emerging markets provide access to growing companies, interesting places, and also diversification against the U.S. dollar and the U.S. stock market in case um, you know, the continued inflationary risks um, slow things down. And then finally, uh, we talked a lot about the 60-40 portfolio, 60% stocks, 40% bonds, but we do have allocations to client and client portfolios to alternative investments, um, private equity, uh, private uh, real assets or infrastructure, 
publicly traded infrastructure. These things are considered alternatives and actually sort of take some of the 60 and some of the 40 and put it into things that we think are, are nice complements to the portfolio. So um, while we, we still believe in the 60, 40 portfolio, that framework, we also look to further diversify portfolios for through the use of, of selected um, alternative investments. So that's our view um, uh, today. And, and uh, we, again, we, um, we, we look at this, we want to look at history, but we also want to highlight some of the opportunities that we see in this market going forward. Thank you, Mark. Great update. If you have any questions or would like to discuss any of the topics we've covered in our webinar updates, please feel free to reach out to Mark or your advisor. And thanks for your trust in Westcott. Thank you.